Okay, everybody, welcome to our revision session looking today at market structures. This is the eighth of our Easter revision sessions. And I hope you found them useful. If you're with us in the live chat already, well over 200 students are joining us. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to uh, contribute to the chat window, some of the questions we have uh, coming up. Uh, if you're watching this on replay, just press the pause button whenever you need to. Take a moment to have a look at the questions, think about your own answers, and then we go through them together as a group. We have a tutor to you study collective and uh, the answers quite honestly in the recent sessions have been nothing short of superb i'm sure the standard will stay very high today so here we go uh oh yeah the other thing is hit the notification bell and hit the like button business studies had a great session this morning they had over 150 likes now i'm sorry that's that's something we can beat for sure so press the like button if you get a moment let's start with a higher or lower game and uh, i thought we'd uh, try this uh, is the market share Let's look at the food retail sector, always a favorite with the examiners, isn't it? Is the market share higher or lower for the following? Well, let's take the co-op to start with. And the co-op uh, has a market share as of March 2023, using the latest Cantor Fitzgerald data. The co-op has a market share coming up of 7.4%. Okay, so uh, let's take another retailer, a food retailer, grocery, chain, a cardo. What do we think? Higher or lower than the co-op? What do we think? Rosetta says lower. Musical Journey says higher. Uh, what do we think? A lot of people saying Zoe says higher. Ocado. Well known, of course, for their robotics at their warehouses. Very capital intensive. Uh, Jordan IU says lower. Uh, what do we think? And I think the consensus seems to be lower. A few people, Rob says 5.2%. 
The answer is 2.3, only 2.3%. That's actually relatively low. It's got a, a market share probably lower than its kind of uh, media profile. Okay, what about uh, the next one, Waitrose? Is it higher or lower than Ocado? What do we think? Um, okay, here we go. A lot of people saying uh, Chloe thinks higher, Oscar, and uh, the Ruben thinks higher. The Riddler making uh, another appearance in our live stream says higher. Pete, Pete Wilson thinks 15%. I think Pete obviously lives in an area where there is a Waitrose, possibly. Here's the answer coming up. And the answer is 5.7%. So it is significantly higher than uh, Ocado, but, but smaller than the co-op, which is often the surprise to people who shop at Waitrose. Now, two more. These are two key ones. Little. Do we think Little's market share is higher or lower than Waitrose? What do we think? The Tutor Chew Collective is getting into action today. We've had our coffee. In our lunchtime session, Lidl is goated, according to Malachi. Uh, a lot of people saying higher, Seb thinks higher, Freya higher. Eva thinks it's, it's now in double figures, 12, 13%. Here's the answer for Lidl. And the figure for March is 9.9%. .9%. So they're on the cusp, the threshold of breaking above 10%. Very rapid organic growth. Most towns these days seem to have a planning application in for a new Lidl. Now, the last one uh, is the following, Aldi. So is Aldi bigger or smaller by market share than Lidl? What do we think? I've deliberately left out here, that's a Tesco and Asda and Sainsbury. Is Aldi bigger or smaller than Lidl? Using the latest figures from Cantor, the kind of market share people. So Connor thinks higher, Sue thinks higher. Uh, what do we got here? Oscar thinks higher. Most people, oh no, Jov Jovni thinks lower. Agree. Ben agrees. Tom thinks double figures for sure. Here's the answer for Aldi coming up on the screen. In fact, it is marginally lower, 8.8%. So well done if you got those right. But keep in mind, everybody, that Little and Aldi are now both bigger than the co-op. And critically, they have, what, 18, upwards of 18, 19% of the market. So it won't be very long matter of months maybe before they break a, break into a 20% combined market share. This is an industry, a market structure, which is changing literally by the week. And it's a favorite for examiners, but they don't have to choose this market. They could choose lots of others. And we're gonna cover quite a few in today's session. Okay, I've got five multiple choice questions for you. So let's have a go. We have over 300 people now in the live stream. And if you, if you wanna post your answer, you don't have to, but it's fantastic if you do, just subscribe and then you can post your answer. Here we go. In which type of market structure are commercial banks usually found? What do we think here? Is it perfect competition? Is it monopoly competition? Is it oligopoly? Commercial banks. What do we think? The consensus of the Tutor Due Student Collective is D, Musical Journey and Merlin uh, and Kieran. Here's the answer coming up. It is indeed. D and of course a key feature is that uh, in an oligopoly interdependent decision making is a essential characteristic businesses have to think not only about their own price uh, decisions but the, the the likely reactions of other firms in the market i actually have a chart for you before we move on to the next question a chart showing the the current market share of commercial banks this is not by revenue not by profit but by assets as you know when commercial banks issue loans they create a new asset on the balance sheet and you can see here that lloyd's is the biggest bank in the uk followed by barclays hsbc pretty familiar affair isn't it but santander is now the fifth biggest bank in the uk spanish bank of course that bought, that bought uh, bradford and bingley a few years back it's a really good example of how a bank this emerged out of a financial crisis a spanish banking giant nationwide and yorkshire are the two biggest building societies in the uk here's our next question have you got this one Oh yeah, Toby says, Bank of Dave, a great film about banks. Absolutely, highly recommended if you're looking for a break, for a vision, the Bank of Dave is fantastic. Now this is a tough one. The diagram shows costs and revenues for a monopoly. Monopoly was producing at P1Q1, but has changed its aim and is now producing at P2Q2. What would not have caused this change? I don't like these kind of questions. This is what, you know, in other words, there were three things that 
could explain that shift in price and output, you're looking for the factor that doesn't explain it. And the answers are coming through. It's always great if you post an answer in the chat window. We, we absolutely uh, love that when it happens. Zoe and Peter and Jerry and Drew and the Riddler have all got the right answer. It's coming up on the screen. The answer is B, of course, it represents a departure from profit maximization. For your exams, everybody, please do revise business objectives, profit max, revenue max, sales max, all that kind of stuff. And uh, you can often show all of those on one diagram. Here's question number three coming up. Okay, the table provides some details of the soft drinks industry. Which market structure best describes this country's soft drinks industry? Okay, there are some harder questions coming up, by the way. And this might be one. A lot of people in the exam got this wrong for some reason. What do we think on this one? 250 firms in the market, 1,000 brands, 65% five firm concentration ratio. A few people saying B, presumably because there's 1,000 brands in the market and many firms. But in fact, the right answer, which uh, people have got mostly, is C. A constant, a people, a lot of people think an oligopoly is where there's only a few firms. That's not correct. An oligopoly is where a few firms dominate the market. And uh, the key thing there is the five firm concentration ratio is above 60%. So it will be an oligopoly. And here's a chart showing the soft drinks market in the UK. Again, I've taken the data for 2022. If you've got a fan, if you're a fan of one or more of these uh, brands, Coca Cola has a working monopoly, 28%. Pepsi, 19%. So together, 47% plus of the market. Then Schweppes, Dr. Pepper. Uh, now, Iron Brew, down there, 5%. Presumably in Scotland, that's fig that figure is closer to 55%. Lucasade, only 4% in the market. Uh, so G5, C5 concentration ratio, there's 73%. Clearly an oligopoly. Next question coming up. Now, this is a tough one. If you get this right, hats off to you. The diagram shows firm's marginal average costs. The firm enters a collusive agreement with other firms and they're going to charge a common price of OP. Now they have to restrict the output to a quota and they're restricted. This firm is restricted to output Q. The firm then decides to cheat naughty in order to maximize its profits. Question is, what is the short run increase in profits? So the firm was given a quota of Q selling at price P. It now decides to exceed the output in an attempt to increase their profits. What's the short run increase in profits? What do we think? They were producing at Q, so they were making some profit, but they then decide to increase output beyond Q. A lot of people are saying A, uh, which is incorrect. Spiny Shell saying this is a solid question. Two right it is. Two right it is. Well, the answer is uh, quite a few people now starting to say C. A couple of people saying B. I reckon in the exam must have been one of the hardest questions, I think. What do you think? Mongo's gone for, for C. Uh, Millie C. F Tom said B. Here's the answer coming up. I'll explain it for you. The answer is C. The profit that we're making at output Q was P, G, N, M. If they increase their output, they're going to they're going to the output will go up to um, above Q, and the profit will be P H J L. So the short run increase in profits is P H J L minus the profits they were making before. Now you should be able to see that G H J K is bigger than L K N N M. So there should be an increase in profits. Okay, next question. A firm is operating in an imperfectly competitive market. It changes its objective from sales revenue max to sales volume max, or sometimes called just sales maximization. And the question is, why might it have decided to do this? What do we think on this one? There are three options there. Increase short run profits, maximize short run market share, minimize short run average costs. What do we think? Okay, so we have to work it through systematically. The collective is saying B and 
Jim, our producer, is going to send the answer through on the electric school board. Here it is. It is indeed B. Yeah, you're sacrificing short run profits. You're trying to gain market share in the short run. And the likelihood is you're probably going to move beyond the optimum cost point. So you're not looking to minimize costs. Well done. If you've got five out of five, by the way, on those, give yourself a uh, give yourself a, a round of applause, but also post in the chat window if you got five out of five. So that everybody else can just celebrate your amazing achievements. Five quite challenging questions, particularly the last couple. Well done, everybody. Uh, or a lot of people are getting four out of five, which is super impressive. Here's a 60 second challenge. Have a go, please. Let's see what we can come up with. Uh, explain what's meant, please, by a contestable market. Over to you. Market contestability is super important. Exam board love, love asking questions on contestable markets. I'll spend about five minutes on contestability. Pick out a few of the answers on the screen. Okay, minute. Minute isn't really enough, is it? But some fantastic answers we saw. What great answer from Ben King there. And here's Bruno's answer. A contestable market is a market for which there is high scope for competition without the market necessarily being competitive in the present. So they're hinting at the threat of entry there, which is quite important. Um, and here's one from Tom Manners. A market in which new firms can enter and compete for market share, likely to have low barriers to entry and exit limited benefits from e-commerce of scale, etc. Now, interestingly, only a few of you were using the two keywords sunk costs. So in the example, if you, if you ask to define a contestable market, the key, and here's a nab is GG, a market that has low barriers to entry and low sunk costs, where, where hit and run profits are possible. The beauty about that answer, it talks about sunk costs and hit and run entry. Here's my answer. A contestable market is a market in which there are low barriers to entry and exit, including low sum costs. And critically, critically, the behavior of firms is influenced by actual and potential competition. Now, interesting, if you think about examples, and I'm not, we're not going to question spot here, but this little graphic on the next slide shows some good examples of contestable markets. And who knows what they're going to choose? Examples love choosing questions about industries where there's a dynamic at work, things are happening. Uh, food retailing we've already mentioned sports nutrition the rise of new products there uh, craft beer my own favorite <laughs> food delivery businesses one of my former pupils founded hello fresh which is pretty big in the uk it's even bigger now in the states shaving products the dollar shave club we'll talk about sportswear in a few minutes the retail energy sector financial services they typically choose an industry which you should know a little bit about hopefully where there's significant demand and supply side changes just in quickly in terms of analysis uh, the key thing about a contestable market is shown on the next slide. So when you get a question on contestability, it's not the number of firms in the market that's important. You can have one firm, one firm in a contestable market. It's unlikely, but you can. It's the ease by which new firms can enter the market. And is always a threat of hit and run entry from a challenger business. Um, and that's really, really important. Uh, Sam 1789 says incumbent firms are vulnerable to hit and run competition. I love that phrase. Incumbent firms are vulnerable to hit and run competition. It's a fantastic explanation. Uh, there is there is on the screen there. Uh, let's just quickly look at the diagram for contestable market. There's really only one diagram to draw. Uh, this slide shows the normal profit maximizing price in output P1 assuming there's a monopoly, for example, the next slide on the build shows what happens if the uh, if there's a threat of competition, firms are more likely to price at P2 rather than P1 if the threat of competition is, is strong. And of course, what I should have done in my diagram is I've drawn the revenue curves to the y-axis 
So you can then bring consumer welfare, consumer surplus into your analysis. But this will be a decent diagram for a contestable market. Hopefully that's useful. Don't forget, we've got videos on all of the market structures, all of them in the on the tutor tube channel. So if you want to go through them, uh, just just check out our contestable markets playlist. Over to you on the next challenge. Can you please give me three reasons why a contestable market is likely to lead to a high level of efficiency? Have a go, please. Okay, some great answers coming through. I like that point from Rohit. Likely to reduce prices closer to the allocatively efficient level. What Rohit's done there with his answer is give me a specific specific example of efficiency, which always makes a difference. Instead of talking in generic terms about efficiency, talk to me about allocative, productive, and dynamic. So well done, Tobias. Talks about high competition leads to firms trying to gain the largest profit margins to fund back into research and development. Again, what you would do there, Tobias, is link it to dynamic efficiency to really smash that particular point. Here are my three points coming up. Uh, yes, allocative efficiency, dynamic and productive. Firms under pressure to keep prices low. So of course, if they price well above cost, there's the threat of hit and run entry from challenger businesses. Uh, there's often in these markets, often a lot of innovation. It's not necessarily game changing innovation, a lot of product innovation uh, to differentiate yourself from a competitor. So a lot of choice in the contestable market, which is good for consumers and productive efficiency. Quite a few people in the live chat were talking about the need to scale back your X inefficiencies, the lack of in a contestable market. The threat of entry is a factor causing firms to keep their costs under control. We call that avoiding managerial slack. And of course, if you can achieve scale economies in a contestable market, you can gain a big competitive advantage. So crucial for the exams, please. Please revise contestable markets for sure, but always link back to efficiency and also economic welfare. Fantastic answers there on that one. Just quickly looking at the sports clothing brand market, I've put on here two, two shirts from two truly iconic sporting clubs. And you think globally, Newcastle United, which is the club I support, and Harrogate Town, a club I, I just love, one of my favourite sports teams in the world. Look at the branding there, beautiful, beautiful shirts. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and Nike has 25% of the clothing market in the UK, Adidas 20%. Uh, Gymshark, emerging brand. How many of you have bought Gymshark in the last 18 months, 20, 24 months? They now have 3% of the UK market. Castori, just under 3%. So keep a look out for Jim Shark and Castori. And congratulations, by the way, to those people who spotted the great, the legend that is Jack Muldoon, who's going to keep us up in League Two. OK, here we go. Uh, can a you know, 60 second challenge for you? Can you please explain what's meant by barriers? Try and type into chat. Nice, succinct, accurate definition of barriers to entry. This is super important. So we move from contestability and monopoly competition towards monopoly and oligopoly, where these barriers to entry are super important. In seconds, nice answer there from Oscar coming through. We'll try and post some answers on the screen. You can't post everybody's answers because there are just so many. iBoy101 prevents a firm entering a market, sunk costs, patents, tech limitations, limit pricing. So that's a nice little shopping list there of potential barriers to entry. You can get some great application by using those. Yeah, most of you are getting some super answers. Can I give you, uh, here's Robbie's answer. There are things firms can do to stop other firms entering the market, brand loyalty, 
uh, natural barriers, high cost industries like air travel, really good examples. Here's my definition. Here's my lame, <laughs> lame attempt. Can I just add in a word here, which I think is super important? Barriers to entry are factors that make it costly and difficult for challenger businesses or rival businesses to enter a market profitably. Profitably. So just adding one word can make a difference to your answer. A lot of you are saying it's hard to enter a market, hard to enter a market and make a profit. So they make a market less contestable, leading to the persistence of super normal profits. So just adding those little extra details in profitability, super normal profits, contestability, turn a definition into a really a star answer. Let's take the industry we thought about. The great Jack Muldoon was showcasing the Harrogate Town shirt. Can you please give me three barriers to entry for a new business trying to break into the UK sportswear market? Over to you. Yeah, really good here. So what a lot of you are doing, this is something we really stress a lot at our live events, is applying a little bit of such as seasoning. So many of you talking about brand loyalty, great point. Uh, I'll add a bit of the economics analysis into that. But if you just add in a couple of brands, brand loyalty to Nike, to Adidas, uh, to whatever North Face, uh, Reapers, brand loyalty and customer emotionally attached. Also a bit of the behavioral economics that comes into play, default purchases, habitual demand, uh, social norms. Uh, a lot of a lot of times, you know, if I start wearing a Harrogate Town shirt at our live events, goodness knows what's going to happen to the sales once people, once the social norms kick in. Uh, let me give you my answers. And again, a little bit of technical detail. Uh, big, big barrier strategy. One is scale economy. So can businesses like Castori, can Gymshark, can they get to scale quickly? to bring down their long run average costs and give them a unit cost advantage, which in theory should lower prices. Brand loyalty, uh, such as to Nike and Adidas, reduces the cross price elasticity of demand. So again, brand loyalty is a fine point, but can you turn it into a really good A star, A grade economics point in the exam? Brand loyalty reduces cross price elasticity and increases the fixed cost of marketing needed for profitable market entry. Can you see how that point two I've developed into a really strong bit of economic analysis? And a lot of brands, Nike and Adidas, of course, they've got multi, the only channel retailers, got many, many distribution channels, strong relationships and retail space. So whatever it is, you know, with JD Sports, it can make it hard for new brands to get products into stores. Partly, of course, while a lot of these brands now just sell online direct to customers. Uh, Jeff, question coming in from George, one of our regulars. Behavioural economics isn't on the Excel spec. If you talk about it, will it be credited? Well, George, behavioural economics is on the Excel spec. Uh, Tony Blair bought it in in 1999. Only joking, George. Uh, regulars will know what I'm talking about there. Uh, it is on the Excel spec as uh, because of the section in paper one on uh, departures from rationality. So behavioural economics will be credited and should be used in your exams. Although there's not as much behavioral economics as um, in other, other boards, in particular AQA. Uh, moving on. Okay, so well done on those. Uh, just quickly looking at telecoms. This is fixed line telecom, I think. So the big five dominate telecom service providers. Who knows? This could be a, a question. Uh, Vodafone, EE, O2, and 3, and so on and so forth. Or well, thinking about that kind of industry, here's our next challenge for you. Can you give me three limits? This is evaluation now three limits on the market power of established firms in an industry. Have a go, 30 seconds. So we know that many firms, established firms, incumbent firms have significant market power, monopoly power, but what are the main limits to the market power of a business? This is really important for evaluation. What are the main limits on market power? 
Nicola talks about possibility of price caps there. Ah, so a couple of people talking about government regulation, competition and market authorities. Excellent points coming in. Uh, Humphrey talks about the fact that predatory pricing is illegal. So oftentimes you can investigate the abuse of uh, market power, anti-competitive behavior. Some great answers coming in. Let me give you my three. What limits market power? First of all, the threat of new entrants. So even if you're a monopoly, you don't have to behave like a monopolist. And the reason is because there's always the threat of new firms chipping away at your market share. Now, here's a great synoptic point. Oftentimes, trade liberalization opens up markets. If you think about Primark, for example, based in Ireland, entering the UK market. Uh, if you think about Santander, Spanish bank, entering UK financial services. So the threat of new entrants. A lot of people talk about price caps, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. CMA blocking mergers and takeovers, investigations into anti-competitive behavior. And crucially, don't forget, you might have market power on the supply side, but there could be some monopsony power on the demand side of the market. So always think about the potential for monopsony. And fundamentally, I want to really want to stress this point in revision here. What limits the market power of a firm fundamentally is whether consumers are willing and able and what they're able to pay. So real effective demand limits market power. We're finding this in the cost of living crisis. A lot of businesses are now realizing that people's real effective demand is not as high as it was. Netflix uh, is a really good example. Sky subscriptions falling like a stone at the moment. And that limits market power. Okay. Thanks to Harris for the super chat. That will pay for my coffee. Really appreciate it. Okay. So next movement coming up. Uh, that was a really good evaluation. 60 seconds. Can you please explain to me what is meant by collusion among firms in an oligopoly? Have a go. Thank you. So we've moved from contestable markets and then we're now going to spend a few minutes on oligopoly. And this is super important. The potential for collusion. Let's see, what do we mean by collusion? How would you define it? in the early stages of an answer, maybe the first KA paradigm. We'll try and put a couple of answers on the screen here. Collusion, of course, has different, different uh, dimensions, but what, what do you understand by the term collusion? Our six second challenge, by the way, is just the idea that if you can type something or write something well in 60 seconds, you know, it's a really good use of the time you have in an exam succinct, accurate definition can send a terrific message to the examiners. Now here's, here's a nice answer from Leah. An agreement between two firms to price set or produce at a certain output. It's exactly right. It's where firms come together to make an agreement. Uh, oh, Jamie Taylor. Wow, there's something coming in from Jamie here which might be worth uh, sharing. Uh, collusion in firms go against the dominant strategy of Nash equilibrium in order to maximize combined profits between the firms. We are going to go through, Jamie and others, just a little game theory example in just a minute or two so that everybody has one example they can use. Jay Keppenstall talks about when firms arrange an agreement, can I be tacit or public? Tacit will be unspoken, so it cannot be fined. Uh, public is when it's known and is, and is an agreement. Some great answers. Let me give you my answers or my answer on collusion. So collusion is the agreement between two or more firms, often many actually, to restrict supply and raise price above the free market competitive level. And there's various ways you can do it. Overt, open collusion, tacit price fixing, sometimes called price matching or price sharing, market sharing, agreeing not to compete, or agreeing to, to rig a, a tendering process. By the way, I have a separate video on uh, forms of collusion on the YouTube channel. So if you want to look at collusion in more detail, just go to our YouTube playlist on Oligopoly. Now, let me just very quickly take you through a game theory example, because some examples require you to have a payoff matrix example. And you could use the, the old prisoner's dilemma, but here's a nice, simple uh, high price, low price situation. So this is two firms. Firm one is in green. Firm two is in red. And they can choose either to charge a high price or low price. Uh, critically in the exam, make sure the table shows what, what the numbers mean. So in this case, it's the expected profit. I put that just for the sake of argument, I put it in dollars, in millions of dollars. So if they both choose a high price, if they collude, 
they can both make $100 million. They both choose a low price, they can both make $50 million. But of course, if they choose, to ch they choose a high price, there's an incentive to cheat on the agreement. Both um, best outcome for each firm is actually to charge a low price. As a result, they're likely to charge a low price, and that's not the best outcome for both firms because they make less profit than if they colluded. Rosetta says, is this worth knowing this for AQA? Yes. I would be having this example or your example in your notes from school of the payoff matrix to show the potential gains from collusion uh, alongside the incentive to cheat, which people have been talking about uh, in the um, in the chat. OK, well done on that. That's just a bit of explanation for you there. Next, uh, a little bit of economics revision for you. Can you just give me two conditions that make it likely easier for firms to collude in an oligopoly. What can you come up with in 30 seconds? Yeah, Robin's point there is on the screen, inelastic demand, price inelastic demand, of course. Uh, that's a good point because if you both charge a high price and demand's price inelastic, uh, then you can get higher revenues. Bruno, I think, had a really good answer. Here's Rob's answer. Asymmetric information, location, and lack of regulation. Rob, they're hinting at uh, the, the relative absence of penalties uh, if firms collude. I think Bruno had a really good answer. Can we maybe bring that up on the screen? Here it comes. A low number of firms within the industry high market share and low punishments in other words the lack of a negative payoff superb answers there well done uh, here are my two points for revision yeah uh, chiming with bruno i guess a small number of suppliers critically to add to bruno's point producing a homogenous product something like cement or oil something which is relatively homogenous and also critically easily the output can be measured so that you can check to see if the quotas are being uh, met. Rosetta has a nice point about small penalty compared to potential gains. That is a terrific point there from Rosetta because that, that suggests a, a cost-benefit calculus of firms engaged in collusion. And critically, on my second point, high barriers to entry, the established firms have similar objectives. They both want to go for joint profit max. So well done on that. Linked with this, can you now evaluate, please give me two reasons why collusion between firms within an oligopoly often breaks down. What can we come up with in 30 seconds? So why does collusion often prove to be fragile in a market? It's often the case, by the way, that collusion, well, nearly always breaks down at some point. It's not a really a long-term strategy. So Hannah brings in the point about cheating. And of course, we, you can use the payoff matrix there, Hannah, to, uh, to amplify that point. And Kate comes in with a lovely point about tempted to break the agreement to make a higher profit. That hints in the idea that there's a kind of incentive there. Uh, Tom talks the incentive to whistleblow. Yeah, especially, Tom, if the penalty for whistleblowing is reduced. In other words, you, you found guilty of, whistle, of, of cheating, but the whistleblowing reduces the penalty. And the Arnu, undercutting and uncertainty. Yeah, lovely. Uncertainty is a really key point in the oligopoly. Ruben, lack of trust and new firms entering the market, potential for whistleblowers. All great points. And here are my two points. Yeah, the temptation to cheat. Uh, if one firm cheats and lowers prices, it makes sense for other firms to do the same. So you go back to your game theory. And critically, and this is nearly always the reason why cartels break down, new firms enter the market. If you set a really high price in a contestable oligopoly, there's a potential for new firms to come in who don't have the same business model. And I think the low-cost airlines, Ryanair, United Airlines, are probably good examples of that. They just had a different business model, a different motivation than the likes of British Airways and Lufthansa. Superb on that. Well done on game theory. 
Uh, let me just give you a couple of bubble quiz questions. I've been fighting hard for the bubble quiz to appear on A-levels. No success. Maybe next year. I'll give you a question. The number of answers can be that are right can be naught, one, two, three, or four. Have a go on this one. Here's the first one. Which of these are potential benefits of monopolies? So if you can post in chat which of those A, B, C, D you think are correct. I've got two of these questions for you. Let's see how many people can get this right. Uh, what are we going for? A lot of people saying A and D. Uh, Liz says A and D. Mungo says A and D. The Tutor 2 Collective says A and D. Let's check the answer. That sounds like a fantastic. It is indeed. Yeah, profits might lead to dynamic efficiency. By the way, that word, if you come to our live events, that word may or might is a hedging word. It's better to use that word than will. And of course, they could be scale economists, particularly with a natural monopoly. B and C are wrong. Prices above marginal cost, relatively inefficient. And oftentimes, monopolies lead to exploitation of supplies. Let's try one more bubble quiz question. I love these. This is a harder one. Which of these are examples of third degree, third degree price discrimination? What do we think? Four nice examples. Do you know, have you covered price discrimination in your revision? Do you know the difference between first degree and second or third degree? If you do, hopefully you might be able to pick out third degree uh, to answer a point from Jake uh, is when you charge different groups different prices for what is essentially the same good or service based mainly on price elasticity of demand. So Rohit thinks all of them. Toby thinks no, it's B and D. Uh, what else have we got here coming through? Lola says B, C, D. And what are those? Owen thinks A, B, C. Tom thinks A, B, D. Quite a range of opinion here. Let's have a look at the answer. Well, I think the answers are A, B and D. Uh, COVID vaccine, really good example of price discrimination. Might not come up this year. Charging a different price for the same vaccine in different countries. Uh, trains, of course, railway companies, classic use of, of um, uh, price discrimination. And whereas business class and economy class, it's a different product. I think it is. If you're flying long, long haul, you know, when I fly to Australia or New Zealand or, or Asia, if you travel on business class, you can, you can fly on a plane the next day. You travel economy, you can't really fly for another week. It's a different product. And petrol service, uh, petrol prices much higher on motorways, much higher. I paid nearly two pounds a litre on the way up to Yorkshire a few weeks ago. It's one pound sixty in how we go to the moment. Big difference there. Okay, almost there. Uh, well done, these market structures. Some great answers, by the way. Let's just finish off by thinking about um, the energy market. And just again, trying to think of examples of, of industries where there could well be a focus to the exam. Go back 10 years, go back to 2010. The big six companies had 100% of the market in energy. Then Ofgem and the government opened up the market to new suppliers. And you can see that the combined market share of the big six has fallen to about 70%. That's the background to the next little challenge. The next slide shows the price cap. So in 2019, Ofgem bought in a price cap it's basically a cap on the average bill. Doesn't mean you have to pay it, but it's basically trying to control energy bills there. So this is really current, very current. Keep in mind the exam was set pretty much this time last year. So you won't have all the data bang up to date. But let's have a go at these two to finish with. Give me two benefits, please, to consumers of a price cap. Have a go, 30 seconds. So the price cap came in in 2019. It was introduced by Ofgem on standard variable tariffs, SVTs. What are the potential benefits to consumers? Can you bring in some, some economic concepts in your answer? What have we got here coming up? So you can write in generic terms. The best answers available we'll talk about, as Nicola has done there, we'll talk about specific economic concepts. Yeah, some good answers coming here. There's a nice, a, or a really nice answer there from Charlie. More affordable energy, social welfare maximised. 
you could almost add to Charlie's answer by saying this is like a progressive policy because energy bills tend to have a regressive effect on low-income families, especially big low-income families. So really nice. Charlie using the concept of social welfare, Nicola using the concept of consumer surplus, and Leo talking about marginal propensity to consume and disposable incomes. So all three of those answers were terrific. And there's many more in the chat. Here's one from Musical Journey. Consumers benefit in the form of lower prices and more allocative efficiency. Here's the point. When you're talking about market structures, use those concepts to get the top marks for analysis. So it's helped control monopoly power of the dominant suppliers. In theory, it leads to lower prices and higher consumer surplus. And it also made bills more predictable. You need to know what your energy bill is, particularly your business, by the way. A lot of consumers, of course, are energy of businesses, pubs, uh, travel companies, and so on and so forth. They don't have to be households. But, but particularly for big, large families with big bills, predictability is, a, is an actual benefit. However, just to finish off with, evaluate for me, please. Why might the energy price cap not have worked or not proved to be as effective as Ofgem thought? Have a go, 30 seconds. So this was a 2019 policy introduced by Ofgem. Controversial. To what extent has the price cap actually worked in reality? What can we come up with? Again, trying to bring in some concepts here would be great. Now, Alex Howard has, has posted in 30 seconds a quite remarkable answer in the time, and there's lots of others flowing through in chat. So thank you for that. Alex says, however, this has pushed out smaller firms from the market, increased the market concentration, reducing contestability, and in the long run may lead to higher prices for monopoly power. That is one of the best answers in 30 seconds that I have ever, ever read in any of these live streams, because there's a chain of reasoning in there, there's some evaluation uh, and hinting at a long run consequence of what is a well intentioned policy. Wow, amazing, amazing answer. And here's my contribution to the debate. Yeah, you can make a case for saying the price cap has actually decreased contestability. A lot of the small suppliers, uh, Bulb Energy, for example, I think went bust in, they bought by Octopus, made big losses. They couldn't, they couldn't hedge against the price increase in energy or they've been snapped up by big firms. Uh, so really, the, the ministry has become less contestable or is likely to be in the future. So a policy that was designed to improve, increase competition has actually led to less competition. And a kind of long run point is the energy price cap on its own is not enough. It doesn't really address why the price of energy for gas in particular is so high. Britain has underinvested in renewables and it really has underinvested in gas storage. The next slide, by the way, just shows this. What I've done here is show you the amount of gas storage in the summer of 2022 in, in a, a range of countries. Germany has 19 times more gas storage than the UK. This is unbelievable application to put in an exam question. Uh, Spain has three times the amount of gas storage than the UK. Probably doesn't need as much gas, but, but Germany is way ahead. So therefore, if you go to the chart on the right hand side, though, when the price of gas is really low, it makes sense to buy up gas in a kind of buffer stock approach and store gas when you can use when the price is high. Germany has been able to do that. The UK has to buy gas at the wholesale price because our gas storage is so limited. And as a result, that's a long term supply side factor causing prices to go up. OK, well, well done. Uh, just very few points on exams as we, as we head in. So we're saying there's 35 days to go before the paper. What I suggest, market structures will appear on your papers. Okay, it has to. It's too big a topic. For many of it's months of work looking at all these different market structures. So please have at least one good applied example of an industry for each of your market structures. Monopoly, oligopoly, opposite competition, contestable markets. Have one of each. I'll be adding some more industry profiles to the YouTube site starting next week. Revise at least two of the main utility businesses, water, telecoms, rail, power, if you want to include that as a utility. Always look to develop your analysis diagrams, shift at least one or two curves to show what's happening. 
and be aware that in a market structure, the actual behavior of firms depends on their objectives. So small firms, challenger firms, different to established firms, so on and so forth. But some unbelievably good answers in the chat window today. Hopefully, if you were watching the chat window, uh, that will have uh, made a big difference to your revision on market structures. So there we go. I've gone a little bit over time today, but the quality of the answers was just so good. We felt we had to showcase uh, some of them. And thank you, by the way, for some of the super chats, which allow me to go buy a, a sandwich uh, for lunch now. Now, um, Business Studies had a session this morning, and they got 140 likes. Well, that's that's rubbish, really, isn't it? I think we can do better than that. So if you, if you found the session useful or enjoyed it, please press the like button, and that would be super helpful. We have a big session tomorrow. Our last, our ninth Easter revision session is on the UK economy. Big special on the UK, lots of application, lots of data, lots of discussion, no doubt. So please come to that 12 o'clock tomorrow, spread the word, tell your friends, uh, and let's see if we can't get at least 500 people in the live chat for tomorrow's mega session. Um, another quick reminder, the Amazon store is the place to go. If you'd like to uh, buy our study companions, they're available for AQN and so. And uh, next day delivery if you've got a Prime account. And they're super useful for annotating and uh, uh, using as a kind of base layer, under armor base layer for your, for your revision. But most of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody who's turned up today. But in particular, people have been to all eight sessions. There's almost a group of you which are every, every day you're here at 12 o'clock for revision. And I really, it's a privilege to be able to to teach you on these occasions. So look after yourselves, stay safe, stay happy, stay curious, and see you sometime soon.